this chapter, as we started discussing yesterday, the chapter birth, it is about uh, a young doctor, Dr. Andrew, and uh, how his life changes in just one night and uh, how he was very casual regarding this uh, case that he had to take care of. He was there uh, helping in the delivery of uh, Mr. and Mrs. Morgan's first child. After 20 years of marriage, they were expecting their first child and uh, they are quite anxious. They want the child to be safe. And for them, Andrew as a doctor represents hope, represents that yes, their dream will come true, that they will be happy, proud parents. And uh, as uh, Dr. Andrew is waiting, you know, is there and uh, so those thoughts about the evening that he had spent, they come to his mind. He's a little disappointed and he uh, is there questioning the institution of marriage. And uh, because he's heard about his friends who are unhappy and uh, maybe they are not there with their you know, partners and all. So he has this very big doubt in his mind because according to him, the institution of marriage is one which is a perfectly happy state. Right. So he uh, carries on with his thoughts and he is not at all you know, present in the moment and he does not realize that what an important you know, uh, case this is going to be. And uh, yes, so when the time for the delivery of the child comes, right, uh, and uh, what happens is that the child is born lifeless. So it's a big shock to Andrew and uh, yes, um, even to... Susan's mother who is there and uh, the nurse is also very shocked everybody very uh, like in a way Andrew felt as if he has disappointed the parents they had a lot of hope had a lot of expectations and he really does not know what to do now he looks at the mother he gives her an injection he wants to revive her so that her breathing becomes normal and she comes to her senses right and she's stable and out of danger then he turns his attention towards the lifeless baby boy and uh, by the time he was looking after susan right what had happened was the nurse she had wrapped the child in newspaper and put the child under the bed and he takes the child out looks at the baby it's a perfectly formed uh, baby there's nothing wrong at all. Yes, it is their limp because it's not breathing. It's looking like it is lifeless. And now he is going to make an effort to bring back the child to life. Will he succeed or will he not? Yeah. Now he's uh, there, you know, like, so, so this is what I say as professionals. And when we talk about doctors, such a, noble profession and yes they have to be very alert and uh, deal with the situation at hand in a very calm manner so here he is there you know trying his best to live up to the occasion and maybe something that he had read earlier came to his mind and he's trying to do that and yes sometimes you have to think out of the box and try to save the day, try to save the situation. So what is a doctor doing? Yes, look here, where is the child? The midwife made a frightened gesture. She had placed it beneath the bed. In a flash, Andrew knelt down, fishing among the sodden newspapers below the bed, he pulled out the child. A boy, perfectly formed. The limp, warm body was white and soft as tallow. The cord, hastily slashed, lay like a broken stem. The skin was of a lovely texture, smooth and tender. The head lolled on the thin neck. The limbs seemed boneless. Right? So here he's there, you know, like he's taken out the child, a perfectly normal child and... Uh, what was there, it just seemed lifeless because the child is not breathing and looking boneless. It's not able to support, support itself. Still kneeling, Andrew stared at the child with a haggard frown. Tired, worried frown is looking at it. 
The whiteness only meant one thing, the whiteness of the child, that is asphyxia pallida. And his mind, unnaturally tense, raised back to a case he once had seen in the Samaritan to the treatment that had been used. Instantly, he was on his feet. So he looked at the child, the child was white. And it, according to him, it was because of you know, suffocation, because of the lack of oxygen. Yes, and that is why the child was appearing to be white. And so he had to do his best efforts to make sure that the child got oxygen, the child was able to breathe. So he, may, he must have read about a similar case, right? He's talking about in the Samaritan and what was the treatment that was done. So he remembered that and immediately he became alert, he became active and started taking measures. Get me hot water and cold water, he threw out to the nurse and basins too, quick, quick. So he's immediately there giving orders to the nurse. But doctor, she faltered her eyes on the pallid body of the child. So the lifeless body of the child she's looking at and she's saying, but doctor, what are you trying to do? Quick, he shouted, snatching a blanket, he laid the child upon it and began the special method of respiration. The basins arrived, the ewer, the big iron kettle. Frantically, he splashed cold water into one basin. Into the other, he mixed water as hot as his hand could bear. So he took two basins. One was of cold water and the other of hot water. So hot water, even he was wanted very hot water that even it was, uh, you know, like uh, difficult to touch it. Then like some crazy juggler, he hurried the child between the two. Now, plunging it into the icy, now into the steaming bath. So yes, so he's right thinking what to do. So he took two basins, one of cold water, one of hot water. He's taking the child, putting it in the cold water, putting it in the hot water again and again, right? And he's uh, quite, uh, you know, like doing this very frankly, this juggler, what, do, what does a juggler do? Right, so managing yeah between two three things, he's trying to catch hold of them. So he's there moving the child from one basin to the other, hot water, cold water, and because he had read about a similar treatment, and he's trying to apply the same because he has diagnosed that the child is it is because of lack of oxygen. Let me try this to bring back the child to breathe, some kind of an arctic respiration. He's trying to do. Fifteen minutes passed. Sweat was now running into Andrew's eyes, blinding him. One of his sleeves hung down, dripping. His breath came pantingly, but no breath came from the lax body of the child. Andrew is in 15 minutes, he's sweating, he's panting, but the child, no breath has come. Lax body, lifeless body, right? So it, nothing has come out of the child. A desperate sense of defeat pressed on him. A raging hopelessness. He felt the midwife wife watching him in stark consternation while they pressed back against the wall where she had all the time remained, her hand pressed to her th throat, uttering no sound, her eyes burning upon him was the old woman. Who's old woman? That is Mrs. Morgan's mother. She was there standing in one corner and just wondering first, she's shocked to know that the child is gone still, right? Now when she's looking at the doctor, she's wondering what is this person doing? What is he trying to do? And she's just standing there very shocked. He remembered her longing for a grandchild as great has been her daughter's longing for this child. All dashed away now. She tied beyond remedy. So he's there very worried, right? And looking at the mother, wondering what to do. And uh, so he is there. When he looks at her, he realizes that she wanted a grandchild. Looked at the mother, she wanted a child. And here he thought all their dreams have been dashed, disappointed. And uh, he's trying his best to make the child, to try some kind of method to bring back the child to life. But now he's thinking it's been 15 minutes and nothing is happening. It seems as the child is not going to breathe. 
The floor was now a draggled mess. Naturally, it watered and everything. Stumbling over a sopping towel, a wet towel, Andrew almost dropped the child, which was now wet and slippery in his hands like a strange white fish. So he almost dropped the child. And the child was wet because constantly putting in the water, the child had become so wet and slippery, it was difficult to hold the child. And he's wondering that the child might not fall out of his hand and it almost did. For mercy's sake, doctor, whimpered the midwife. It's still born. So the midwife is there and she's quite uh, worried. What is he doing? And uh, yes, so mercy, please just uh, stop this. The child is still born. Andrew did not heed her, beaten, despairing having labored in vain for half an hour. He said, it's been half an hour. Let me try just one more time. He still persisted in one last effort, rubbing the child with a rough towel, crushing and releasing the little chest with both his hands, trying to get breath into the limp body. So what is he doing? Alternating between hot water, cold water. And now he's rubbing the chest with a towel, trying to, you know, yes, bring breath into that limp body. Limp is, once again, lifeless. So he's making very, very sincere efforts. And then, as by a miracle, the pygmy chest, the tiny chest of the little baby, which his hands enclosed, gave a short convulsive heave. Another and another. So the child there convulsive, you know, shaking and the chest is rising. And then one again and again, the child giving that shake, right? Movement. Andrew turned giddy. He was so surprised. The sense of life springing beneath his fingers after all that unavailing striving was so exquisite, it almost made him faint. He redoubled his efforts feverishly. So he had given up. That was just one last attempt he was doing, rubbing the child with the towel and making the child breathe. But yes, and then all of a sudden, right in his hands, the child started moving, the child started breathing. And he was so surprised that he himself was going to faint. And feeling that life coming back, feeling that life in his hands, it was such a remarkable moment. He redoubled his efforts feverishly. So he made more efforts. The child was gasping now, deeper and deeper. So the child was actually breathing and gasping for breath. A bubble of mucus came from one tiny nostril a joyful iridescent bubble. So even from his nose, you know, the bubble started coming out. The limbs were no longer boneless. They were boneless because the child was not breathing. Now the child is there breathing and gasping and moving. So the limbs have also become alive. There's life in them. There are bones in them. The head no longer lay back spinelessly without support. But now the head is there. The child is there, right? Moving, the blanched skin was slowly turning pink. What had happened to the skin? Because of constantly moving, uh, alternating between hot water, cold water, the child uh, had almost uh, turned what white. And now with the breath, the circulation has begun. Yes, it's getting in the lungs, they're getting the air, uh, the heart beating once again and the body regaining its color. So the child is there, the little baby is there turning pink again. Then exquisitely came the child's cry. That this child started crying. Dear father in heaven, the nurse sobbed hysterically. It's come, it's come alive. So the nurse over there, she's, you know, like quite surprised and she herself is there in tears. That it's a miracle. This child has come alive. Andrew handed her the child. He felt weak and dazed. About him, the room lay in a shuddering litter. Blankets, towels, basins, soil instruments, the hypodermic syringe impaled by its point in the linoleum. The ear knocked over. 
the kettle on its side in a puddle of water. Upon the huddled bed, the mother still dreamed her way quietly through the anesthetic. The old woman still stood against the wall, but her hands were together, her lips moved without sound. She was praying. So the old woman, who's the old woman? The grandmother. Just standing there, unable to move, unable to say anything. But right now she's saying a prayer of thanks, right? The mother is unaware of what is going on. She was still under the influence of the anesthetic, right? So she is there, uh, the grandmother, just looking at all this and uh, just praying a thanks prayer that she's giving. Mechanically, Andrew wrung out his sleeve, pulled on his jacket. I'll fetch my bag later, nurse. So he's there, you know, like he's just finished his job and he's also very exhausted, very tired and he's gone to wear his jacket. I'll fetch my bag later, nurse. He went downstairs through the kitchen into the scullery. His lips were dry at the scullery. He took a long drink of water. He reached for his hat and coat. Outside, he found Joe standing on the pavement with a tense, expectant face. And Joe had been there standing outside all night, waiting for news. All right, Joe said. He said thickly, right? He's quite exhausted. Both all right. It was quite light, nearly five o'clock. So whole night went. And uh, Joe, uh, you know, like, yes, there waiting outside. And Dr. Andrew doing his best efforts to take care of both mother and child. And he was successful in that. A few miners were already in the streets. The first of the night shift moving out as Andrew walked with them, spent and slow, his footfalls echoing with the others under the morning sky. He kept thinking blindly, oblivious to all other work he had done in Blenary. I've done something. Oh God, I've done something real at last. So yes, so he's been there. It's his presence of mind. It is his courage and uh, to go against, uh, you know, what uh, are the norms. So he decided to take matters in his hands and he felt that uh, when the child the baby was lifeless, that he is disappointed. Everyone who had so hopes, you know, and here he would uh, not like to see disappointment on their faces. And this was a case similar to that he had seen. And so he wanted to, you know, maybe do the same again. And so what did he do by alternating between the hot and cold water, by rubbing the child, trying to make it breathe? He was successful. He did not give up. And as a result of it, he was able to, you know, like maybe, yes, uh, save uh, the hopes of the parents and the grandmother. And yes, in the end, he says, oh God, I have done something real at last. So yes, yeah, so this is something very different from maybe the routine cases that he was doing. And this is something that really required his presence of mind. This is something that really required a lot of courage. And uh, so he felt that as a doctor, this is what he is supposed to do. He is supposed to be there for his patients, try to think out of the box, try to handle the difficult situation, and most importantly, live up to the hopes and uh, the, you know, the expectations that patients have from him. Right? Yes?